Welcome to this special episode of uh, Defence Budget 2018. Uh, traditionally, Defence Budget has been a subject of interest, uh, but this time around, I think healthcare uh, took the shine away from Defence, and people, I haven't seen many people discussing about the allocations towards Defence and. Um, which is, which is quite unnatural in the sense that defense is one of the most important allocations that the budget talks about. So, uh, but now I think we, in our endeavor to do uh, focused, segmented analysis of the budget, uh, we have Colonel Rakesh Sharma with us. Colonel Rakesh Sharma is uh, an ex-serviceman uh, having put in 32 years of service in the infantry division and uh, is one of the people who uh, uh, who, dis who got disabled in uh, while uh, while uh, carrying out a counter insurgency uh, strike uh, i think uh, the importance of the defense budget is understood by a person no better than Colonel Rakesh Sharma because they have lived through the pain of being a subject of a warlike situation, whether it is insurgency or it is an enemy strike, whichever. So I would uh, welcome Colonel Sharma, Colonel Rakesh Sharma, and uh, before we get into the discussion, I would like to first of all get your view about the overall budget, not just the defense budget, but overall budget. Uh, before I get into that, I just like to highlight one point. Uh, this most of the people uh, they do not quite appreciate what is happening. Uh, you see the. Uh, uh, it cannot be looked at in isolation. Uh, the uh, national interest or national security or the national power of a country is derived from uh, various factors and various aspects. The most predominant aspect of that is the economic ability to sustain uh, the national will. The second most important thing is the stability of the internal decision making institutions, the executive, the legislature, the judiciary, the bureaucracy, the administration, the military are all wings of the government. The third most important factor, which uh, I will come to later while I'm listing this out, is the uh, stability of the society. And with examples, I can quote that where societies are unstable, even if you have a strong economy, even if you have a strong military, it, it, gets, it gets destabilized very fast. The fourth most important thing is dependence on external resources, critical dependence, say, on, on for oil or for weaponry or for all those things. Uh, then comes the military power, the, the uh, strength of the, the defense forces as an institution, their decision making, their hierarchy. And lastly is the diplomatic prowess, the ability of the country to uh, impose or convey its viewpoint convert others to its viewpoint. Now, the military might and the diplomacy and the strength of the internal institutions go hand in glove. But all these three have to be backed by a stable society. Now, that is where the present budget is focusing. The present budget is focusing on the deprived sections of the society who have not got their dues for so many years. It's a shame that today, uh, for want of proper treatment, people are, you know, losing lives. Uh, the availability of health care in rural areas is uh, absolutely poor. Similarly, the education. If you have to get your society stable, you need a very strong and vibrant middle class. The middle class will only come when you have good education, when you have job opportunities. A person is looking for, for a fruitful life. If you don't have that, then that person will be prone to disruptions. 
A classic example that I can give is two countries. One is Egypt and one is Turkey. Both countries, uh, very uh, strong, stable internal systems, uh, very prosperous, a lot of money, strong army. But today the societies are crumbling. Why it's crumbling? Because the base of the society, the social structures are crumbling now. This is what we have to understand. In this light, if we really look at our military budget, or as in the general budget, uh, we are the fourth largest military spender in the world after US, China, and UK. Now, uh, UK is slipping. They have reached a stage where they are can, uh, I mean, uh, cannibalizing typhoons to keep their aircraft flying. They are selling their aircraft, auctioning their aircraft carriers on cash and carry basis. Uh, so we might may get ourselves upgraded to third biggest military spender, but that's no consolation. Uh, this was my overall uh, take on the present budget. Okay, so uh, but coming back to uh, the allocations that have been done, how how do you see uh, what what according to you are the highlights of this year's defense budgets? Uh, you see, the if you really ask me in absolute terms, uh, it is a standstill defense allocation. Uh, the additional allocation that has been done, uh, if you uh, factor in inflation, then uh, it washes out the uh, the whatever increment has been given. But the to understand the defense budget, we have to understand its components. Uh, one component is the revenue expenditure, and the second component is the capital expenditure. Right. Now, uh, the uh, worrying factor is that the revenue expenditure is now uh, almost running away, and that is something that we have to find as a nation a solution to. Uh, the revenue expenditure is running away because of the uh, ballooning uh, pension bill. Uh, the you know, for an average soldier who joins service at the age of 18, he's 95 to 96 percent of the force, serves only 22 years. That means at the age of 40, between age of 40 and 45, in the prime, with most productive years, when he has gained his experience, he is uh, taken out of the uh, service. Uh, this is an institutional requirement. Now, as a country, we have to find ways. To, because this person lives on for next 40 years. He lives to the age of, uh, today the average age is uh, 68, 69. So he lives for 30 years as a pensioner. He served for 22 years and he lives for 30 years as a pensioner. Uh, uh, slightly I'll drift away from this to highlight this point. That in Europe, uh, countries, uh, especially if you look at uh, your, uh, the southern European countries, where the uh, fertility rates have dropped, the, they are considering to revive the retirement age. Uh, Italy was proposing at one time to raise it to 72 years. So uh, that is something that we have to see how we can reduce our uh, pension budget. But that apart, uh, then I come to the, uh, our, there is a need to restructure our uh, forces. Uh, there already, uh, government is addressing that. The Shekhar Committee report has come in. Certain structural changes are being made. Uh, hopefully, we should see some forward movement on that. Uh, coming to the capital expenditure, uh, the capital expenditure is on two parts. Uh, one part is acquisition of new weapon systems and new weapons. The second part is on creation of, again, it's part of capital expenditure, but it's a creation of infrastructure and assets like new air bases, uh, new you know uh, ports, new dockyards, all those kind of things. Uh, there, uh, again, you see, uh, this year, like we have got uh, almost uh, 99 uh, lakh, 99,947 crores as uh, the capital expenditure budget. Out of this, almost 80% is prior commitment. That means that uh, this will be pay the contract obligations which have already been executed either in the previous financial year or years earlier. As the deliveries come in, payments will be made. That's the one thing. Uh, only 3.67% is available for fresh contracts. But then this is not a worrisome figure because uh, it would only involve paying up to maybe 10 to 
17% advance if any new contracts are negotiated. Uh, one aspect on capital expenditure that I would like to uh, uh, highlight here is for people to understand why the defense forces have been saying that last 20 years we have been neglected. Uh, for any uh, defense equipment uh, or technology, there is a life cycle. Now, ideally, the mix of the life cycle should be that uh, at least between 20 to 30 percent of the equipment that you have should be state of art, the latest technology. About 40 percent or 50 percent should be the current technology and about 20 to 30 percent again should be the uh, you know uh, equipment that is about to be uh, at the last leg of its uh, service life. So you can you know then start discarding it as new equipment comes in. Unfortunately, in our case, in last 20 years, we have had no such holistic planning. Uh, fortunately, now certain mechanisms have been put in. Uh, things are coming in, and we are getting to, we are getting there. Uh, to highlight a problem, you know, one aspect of uh, you see, buying defense equipment is not like going to a showroom and picking up a car. There's a whole uh, process of, uh, you know, uh, technology, technology upgradation, and there's a production line that's set up, the production line produce, and then as the production of the equipment is, you know, getting outdated or obsolescence is setting in, you need new technology to come in. So you need a parallel production line which is producing the new items or the latest technology. Uh, I highlight this because this, this thing had been in news for, for quite some time uh, really regards to the uh, war wastage rate of ammunition. We have uh, put in processes to expedite this, but even with these expedited measures, it will take us anything up to four to five years to reach the desired levels of stocking of war wastage ammunition. Uh, just to highlight the problem that are faced. Uh, the, uh, so this is how the uh, capital uh, expenditure budget works. Any uh, query? No, it's fine. I mean, uh, so uh, to look at it uh, prior to budget, what were the things that you expected the defense budget to provide? And how much of it has actually been met, those expectations? Uh, the, you see, bu budget... Uh, Budgetary support is for the uh, what is being planned within the army. Uh, we are now like in, we are in the midst of uh, inducting M777 uh, howitzers that has been provided for. Rafales are coming in this year, next year, and next financial year. So th that will be expenditure spread across three years. Similarly, we'll be getting uh, chain hook helicopters and we'll be getting uh, Apache helicopters. This will be coming in. Uh, one place where I'm very uncomfortable is the, uh, I shouldn't be saying so, but uh, there is no quality assurance on DRDO. There is no, you know, there's no pressure on DRDO to deliver. Okay. Uh, it is, it is very well to say that DRDO is doing a wonderful job. They are doing a wonderful job, but unfortunately the results on ground, except for the high tech missiles and the missile systems, uh, DRDO has uh, not delivered that much. Uh, the the uh, now, uh, but one good thing that has happened. Uh, this was uh, recommended over a period of time with the various interactions with Vicky uh, had and which uh, this uh, the uh, the Bharat Shakti also had was uh, we had uh, proposed that there should be some form of technology incubation by the government. Uh, here, the government has taken a positive step. They have called. They have created a technology development fund of 141 crore rupees. Uh, this would be given to support the development and prototypes, making prototypes of whatever is developed in India. Uh, we never had this kind of a thing. Uh, we never had that, uh, you know, concept of research to, uh, you are using a particular generation of equipment. There was no parallel research to get the next generation of the same equipment in. A classical example, again, I'll give you, is of MiG-21. We have been manufacturing MiG-21 in our country for the last 20, 25 years. But yet, we have not had any design bureau in India to upgrade the next generation of MiG-21 aircraft. 
Tejas came in, but Tejas came in as a very late date as a replacement. But there was no design bureau incorporating the technology and going in for further research. Okay. <clears throat> so now, I mean, uh, uh, I am a non-military person and uh, uh, when I look at a budget, I, I think all that money, that 99,947 crores that's being spent on the capital uh, procurement uh, expenses, uh, I, I, I feel a little comfortable that perhaps uh, my, my nation is a little more war ready than it was before. Now, uh, so my question is, do you think the budget really takes us to a greater safety as a nation in a, in a, in a world where the geopolitics is taking um, a turn every second day? Uh, do you think it uh, makes us more safe? Uh, I would answer this in a different way. Uh, you see, uh, any adversary uh, needs to pause and think of our capabilities. Uh, in last three years, we have acquired a capability to inflict prohibitive damage. We may not be able to win over an enemy, but we have acquired the capability to inflict prohibitive damage on him if there is any need. And that in itself is a reason why now countries are coming to India, again, uh, no, not related directly to the defense budget, but uh, the, uh, you see, uh, China backed down at Doklam. Why? China mm -hmm. knew that it could not push or to have a confrontation with India across the entire east to west northern border. Mm -hmm. So, that is why they backed down because they knew our capability. They knew that if at any point of time, at any point of area, or any point of interest, we have the capability to inflict prohibitive damage on them. That's that's really reassuring. And uh, so, overall, what would you rate the budget and the defense budget as in a scale of ten? Ten being the uh, highest. <laughs> uh, I'll. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. overall, I think the the entire budget, I would rate it at eight. Uh, okay. Defense budget, I'll I'll uh, reserve my rating because uh, you see, uh, there is a very factor in defense budget, and that is that uh, which we have to understand. That uh, I'll again quote figures in two thousand nine, the total defense budget that was allocated, we surrendered. 12.77% of it as unspent. That is criminal. Uh, in 2014, it was 13%. In 2015, it was 15%. Now, this 2015 was because our draft procurement manual was in the works. The, the era. Our previous Raksha Mantri, uh, Shri Manohar Parikarji, had uh, worked on it. He brought out a new defense procurement manual. Uh, last year, we have brought it down to 8.6. That's a very welcome move. We have to reduce this unspent amount of budget because that means that uh, actually means that, you know, it, in a way it is a reduced allocation. If you're not spending any money, that means that you may be, you may be allocated uh, 1000 crores. But if you're spending only 900 crores, it means that your allocation actually de facto is 900 crores. Uh, so that is one fact that I wanted to highlight at this stage. Uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, I mean, uh, another aspect that I wanted to highlight was that uh, why I am hesitant to, uh, you know, grade the military, uh, the budget, defense budget. Uh, see, China has a GDP that is three times our GDP. And their defense is 2%. Our defense spending as a percentage of GDP is 1.58%. Uh, so we can, you know, uh, arrive at how much uh, in absolute terms, percentage terms and all this is very good for statistics. But in absolute terms, uh, how much money we need to do. So, But most important thing is we need to get our systems in place that spend our money effectively, that we spend our money well, and like we have a saying in the army, 
that we get the biggest bang for the smallest loop. Right, right. So uh, that was uh, actually a very uh, enlightening uh, discussion for me because uh, most of the things I didn't know that there was such a such an inordinate uh, uh, gap in uh, the spending. I mean, uh, so much of unspent amounts. Uh, but what what uh, what do you attribute this to? I mean, what, where where did we go wrong? Why why was it not uh, utilized despite allocation? Uh, the, the 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 problem is uh, there are there are one is a systemic problem. Uh, our uh, our uh, the procurement systems are so uh, straight jacketed and they are so uh, you know. Uh, uh, Fear driven, fear of being painted as a corrupt practice. Uh, you see, uh, for, for, for all his intentions or whatever, uh, I personally, as an individual, I do not believe in blacklisting a firm that is paid bribes. Uh, bribe, if, uh, if any company has paid a bribe, penalize the company to double the amount of bribe. If they paid 5 crores, penalize them 10 crores for the bribe amount, but continue with the order. Why? Because the equipment has been tested, tried and approved for induction. Now this testing and trial period is very long. It is very exhaustive. If you have to do it from a scratch, it takes you back almost 3 to 4 years. And that is what has unfortunately happened during UPA 1 and 2 tenures. Any one deal, the opponent would say that there's a bribery in this, there's a scandal in this, and Ministry of Defense promptly playing safe would cancel the deal. So carry out your investigation. If you feel that there has been a bribe, impose a penalty, but get the equipment. You you need the equipment today. I, I, if you ask me the certain equipment which we need as of yesterday, mm. but unfortunately, but here on now, what we are seeing now, especially in case of critical equipment where we are going from government to government purchase. Uh, that's a very welcome move because in the short term it will uh, bridge the gap and hopefully in long term we would be able to uh, have our procedures and systems streamlined for faster procurement. Yeah. So, uh, Connell, I think uh, we will be keeping a close watch on the developments in this sector and uh, would be possibly doing a quarterly or a half yearly review of how things have gone since the budget uh, that came up. Uh, so we would be looking forward to have further discussions with you and thank you for having joined us. Uh, thank uh, you very much. Uh, I would just make uh, one last uh, recommendation. I hope this reaches the, some of the decision makers. That we need to have a targeted allocation. Uh, rather than you know having a general allocation, we need to have targeted allocation with targeted timelines and targeted technology level induction. You know, uh, the if that is what we do we should be able to bridge the gap between intent and delivery uh, we have to uh, do something really well fast great i think i think it, your words will reach the right ears and some action will be uh, initiated on that uh, thank you thank you for joining us thank you thank you very much it's a pleasure